So it's a pleasure to be here, and I'd like to thank the organisers for the opportunity of talking to you about something uh, to which uh, I am very attached, which is lung disease, and to in particular about interstitial lung disease. And um, interstitial lung disease is a particular problem that occurs in certain situations, and it is um, also particularly problematic to people who have it. Sorry. So interstitial lung disease is lung tissue disease. So the word interstitial means that which is between spaces, and the spaces are the blood space and the air space. So this is the lung tissue, which is usually very thin, flexible, and thin enough for gas to pass through easily. Now what happens in this condition is that that area becomes thickened and swollen, and so it's harder for gas to get through. So that interstitial lung disease causes problems with getting oxygen into the blood. The second thing it causes is that instead of the lung being nice and soft and pliable and, and spongy and easy to open and close when you breathe in and breathe out, all that becomes stiffer. So it's like having to move leather instead of moving saran wrap. And that makes it harder to breathe in and out. And the lung volume, the amount of breath one can take, that goes down. So it's common that a person complains of breathlessness with this condition. And then the third part of the harm that occurs in interstitial lung disease is a little bit insidious, it's a little bit nasty. Now, have you heard from Nathan Handley yet, or is he coming? Okay, so you heard about pulmonary vascular disease. So the blood vessels have to get through the lungs, they have to pass really close to the air spaces so that oxygen can get into the blood and carbon dioxide can get into the, blood, into the air and be breathed out. But in lung tissue disease, the blood vessels that are finding their way through the lung tissue find themselves obstructed. It's like trying to find your way through a jungle. You've got all these collagen fibers and scar tissue that are getting in the way and making things rigid instead of flexible and closing off the spaces in which the blood can pass through. So now the blood doesn't get through the lungs as easily as it should. It doesn't get to pick up oxygen like it should. It doesn't have as many places to go. And it's one of those problems that contributes to what Nathan is expert in, and that is the high pressures that develop between the heart and the lungs. So that's the sort of the, the harm that can occur with interstitial lung disease. Difficulty taking a breath in, difficulty in getting oxygen across from the air spaces into the bloodstream, and then difficulty with getting blood through the lungs. It's like having a clogged filter. The liquids just don't get through as easily as they should. So, is there a thing that moves those things automatically? <laughs> <laughs> what I need is a, is a gentle taser. Just give me a little zap. <laughs> so I am involved in the research into various parts of lung disease for a while, and I, I don't think that my involvement in those influences what I have to say tonight, but you can be the judge of that later. So, go on. So, when you think about interstitial lung disease, so it's got different names to different people. So pulmonary fibrosis is just the sort of nasty thing that us doctors do, is which we turn the English into Latin and make it sound like we know what we're talking about. <laughs> so pulmonary means lung, fibrosis means scar tissue is being formed. So this is just the same thing again, scar tissue in the lung. But it sounds important when we say pulmonary fibrosis. The important thing on this slide is that there's over 150 causes at least. There's probably a whole lot more. But there's an awful lot of causes of this. So when people come with these problems, we have to be careful that we know why they're being caused. It's probably scleroderma if you have scleroderma, but it's not always. And when we think about causes of pulmonary fibrosis, this is the sort of thing that we should be thinking about all the time when we see patients, even when they come with a known connective tissue disorder. But we should think of other things that can cause this, particularly aspiration at the bottom there. And, just in case your lives weren't complicated enough, a lot of the medications that other doctors like to prescribe to you cause trouble to your lungs. Now obviously Dr. Hambly and I never do this, we never cause you harm, but all those other doctors who are giving you medications like methotrexate and things like that, you know, uh, but seriously a lot of, almost every, not, I mean there's a list of drugs that can cause a lung problem is as long as your arm. And, Luckily, there's a computer-based database website that we can go to called pneumotox.com, and anybody can go to this. It's in the public domain. 
and you can find out, we can find out uh, quickly if a drug that you're on uh, for whatever reason could cause a problem with interstitial lung disease or any other pr problem with your breathing that we should know about. Because that's a particularly crucial thing for us to know before we go giving you another treatment for a problem that we're causing with something else. And I think that would be a responsibility that all of us doctors would have to, to clear that off the list of possibilities early on when we see you with interstitial lung disease. So, how do we know? Well, you could be a genius like some of my colleagues, or else you could just do hard work, which is that we listen to you, telling, you what you, telling us what you're complaining of. And the two main symptoms are cough and shortness of breath. So there's already a couple of people coughing tonight. <laughs> the couple of you might have gotten short of breath on the way in from the parking lot, or getting up the stairs or whatever. So cough and shortness of breath happen to everybody. The challenge is, is it happening in a pattern that predicts that there's a problem, and is it happening progressively? So we would listen to how far you can walk and how it's changed and whether there's other features of your story, but the symptoms are crucial to tell us is it present and is it getting worse. We do an x-ray, which is a good start, and then most importantly you do a CT scan with high resolution technique, and that's the best way for looking at the lung tissue. So CT scans are terribly important to us for knowing what's happening in lung tissue and whether it's changing. And then the next thing is, you know, even though the lungs don't look good on the CT scan or the x-ray where they have some extra tissue in them, so they look a bit grey, a bit fuzzy, instead of being all black, air is black on an x-ray and a CT scan, tissue is, is grey-white and then calcium is pure white. So the more grey and white stuff you have in the lung fields, the more trouble that's there. But in the same way as some people in the room have grey hair and like to think that they haven't lost a touch or lost a step, I see Hambly coming up in my rear view mirror is the latest hot thing in lung disease and I'm hanging on by my fingertips but I'd like to think that even though my hair is grey I can still think. In the same way <laughs> lungs can look grey on a CT scan or x-ray and they can still work very well so just having an appearance of something looking wrong isn't enough. We look for impairment and that's why you have a breathing test. If, you have, if you're being suspected of having one of these conditions, you have breathing tests and they're repeated very often, particularly the simple breathing test, which is spirometry. Again, that's a nice Latin word. Anything that ends in metri means we've measured it, a metric. And spiro, you'll have heard the old Latin phrase, dum spiro, spiro, dum spiro, spiro, as long as I breathe, I think. So if your sp spiro is the breathing, so spirometry is the measurement of a breath, one full breath, what can you do? And then there's the more complex pulmonary function test where we measure gas exchange, that's the oxygen business. So depending on what we need to know, we do a simple one for a full breath. That gets how stiff the lungs are and how big a breath you can take. And if we have to know more, then we do the diffusion test, the oxygen, carrying, oxygen diffusion capacity measurement of the lung, and that's the other thing we do. And of course, most people are fine at rest. So the great thing about lung disease is that the people have wasted for about an hour in the waiting room before they come in to see you, and then they walk about 15 steps down to the room, and they're fine. They're not short of breath at all, because they've had an hour to wait, and they're grand. So as long as you keep the interview short and say, how are you, fine, good, keep going, you're grand. But if you ask them, how are you when you walk, or how are you when you do stairs, or how far can you go, that's when you find out that there's an impairment. So an exercise test, a walk test on a corridor, or an exercise test on a stationary bike where you pedal as far as you can, those are crucial things for us to measure because they give us an indication of your exercise capacity and that tends to go down in interstitial lung disease. And of course we can repeat all those tests in order to find out are things getting worse. So is there a disease? How bad is it? Is it getting worse? Is there a cause, an association, or is it drug induced? So those would all run through our mind. Might steroids work if it's inflammatory? And then is there something else we should be doing? So most of those questions are easy to answer in the scleroderma population because we're dealing with scleroderma associated lung disease. And we're able to fast forward, as long as the man will fast forward here, we'll be doing all right. Go again, yeah. So keep going. So this is a graph of how things change in survival. And survival is getting better. Every five or 10 years, survival in this disease is getting better and better. I don't have upgraded information, but I'll tell you one thing that because 
what's happened in, in the changing profile of scleroderma and how it's affecting people, because the kidney doctors suck, got so good at their condition, us lung doctors have to pull up our socks because lung disease and pulmonary hypertension has been a major cause of morbidity and mortality in this disease, but now we're doing a much better job because of new drugs. You've heard about it from Dr. Hamley, and now we're trying to play catch up with interstitial lung disease and some new drugs there. So that's the organ-specific mortality, showing a change in the shift. The bottom line is that people used to have major trouble with kidney disease. Kidney doctors are really good. Now people have problems with, with the thorax, pulmonary hypertension, interstitial lung disease, and we think we're getting better as we go along. I can't talk about this problem without talking about another one. So in the chest, that hollow organ that connects your mouth to your stomach, which got a little workout probably earlier on if you had something to eat and drink, the esophagus doesn't work in, a, in almost every patient with scleroderma. When problems with the esophagus working lead to things coming back up, fluid, acid, anything else, and if any of that gets into your lungs, that's called aspiration. That's inhaling something that was swallowed or should have been swallowed. That is well known to aggravate interstitial lung disease. So if any of you have interstitial lung disease, us types are supposed to be very careful about your eating and swallowing, doing our best that we can to encourage that you swallow effectively and don't damage your lungs further. So we make progress with clinical trials. In general, we thought this was an inflammatory disease, so we used anti-inflammatory drugs. And the new horizon is that because there's fibrosis, which we said was scarring, would you believe it that we finally have an anti-fibrotic drug, an anti-scarring drug? We have two. So those are what's on the horizon. So that's why I speak with a certain excitement and optimism when we talk about the fact that the shifts, the sands are shifting. The graph is going to have a turn. The lung diseases, the pulmonary hypertension of Dr. Hambly, the interstitial lung diseases with the rest of us, we see optimism, we see improvement in outcomes in the future because we've just finished working out anti-inflammatory drug therapy to some degree, and now we're starting on anti-fibrotic therapy. So the two main mechanisms by which the lungs don't work in this condition, which is inflammation and scarring, we now have drugs of proven benefit for both of these mechanisms. And that's really a cause, I believe, for some optimism. So that's very complicated. <laughs> the bottom line here is that it works. So this is, these are the antifibrotic drugs. Now what we see here is two different colored lines. The top one is things going better. The vertical axis is change, so the less drop means the less change. The light blue line is what happened to people around the placebo or inactive drug in these trials. The top dark blue line is what happens with the antifibrotic profenadone. So that drug has been shown in a pure scarring disease, pulmonary fibrosis of, it, of unknown cause, and now it's being examined in scleroderma, which is pulmonary fibrosis of a known cause. That's also complicated. It says that there's about six different ways that this drug could work, more the merrier, and again it works. So this is an intedinib, an antifibrotic drug, does almost exactly the same thing if effectively, which is protecting from loss of volume in people who have got idiopathic, that is lung scarring of unknown cause, and now we're looking in patients who have lung scarring of known cause, which is scleroderma or other illnesses, and we are very optimistic that lung scarring, no matter what causes it, will be inhibited by one of these two drugs. So that's the news. Good, so these trials are underway, and some of you may have already been invited to join them, uh, and, uh, and these are going on around the world in different countries. Um, and uh, they'll be reported in a year or two. Go ahead. So the anti-inflammatory treatment, because that's the current standard. Just a word or two about that. These are just a list of the drugs that are being used, but mainly a cyclophosphamide and mycophenolate. Go on. Scleroderma study, lung study, showed the cyclophosphamide worked to protect, uh, to improve breathing capacity. Go on. Over the course of two years, there was benefit. Now the further apart those lines, the more the benefit. Now of course you can see that after two years the lines went together again, which is a bit disappointing. But what this means is that for a year of treatment, there was longer than a year of benefit of cyclophosphamide. So our challenge now is to capitalize on that year of benefit and try and extend it in patients with cyclophosphamide. This drug was given by mouth. If we give the drug intravenously, we might get the same benefit without too much toxicity. So we might be able to string out the length of time we can give cyclophosphamide. It helped breathlessness, measured by this scale, 
and it helped the skin score measured by the Rodman skin score. When Dr. Khalidi and his colleagues go foosting around, it, they're pushing the fingers together and they're counting one and two and they move on to the toes and then they go at your chest and they go around. I find that very intrusive. You'd be poking around at the people's thorax. But anyway, they come up with this number and that's when that number goes down, that's a good thing. And cyclophosphamide made the number go down. <laughs> so, carry on. Good. What we know from that study, and it's terribly important, it's a bit like climbing Mount Everest. You don't climb to the top the first day. You go out and you establish a base camp. And then you do another foray and you move up another bit. And you stock up your supplies and your things. And then you come back and sometime later you have an assault on the peak. And it's the same way in clinical research. We don't necessarily solve all our problems the first time. So trials tend to get us to a certain threshold. And now things that we couldn't see before become visible and become important for us to establish. And it's the same thing with this. So we know the cyclophosphamide works. We don't know for how long it, we can use it. We don't know how we can reduce its side effects, but at least we know it's worth trying. And then we had the second study. Go on. And this one looked at the role of mycophenolate, which is an easier drug sometimes to use, less side effects than cyclophosphamide, and one which we know from the kidney transplant world can be used for years. Cyclophosphamide we can only use for one or two years. And then you, meet, you reach a safe maximum total. To this drug can be used for years, 10 years. So that's a whole new world. Go ahead. Um, go on, yeah. Yeah, that's the study design to compare the two. That's very complicated. Go on. <laughs> there we go. So the blue line is the new drug. The red line is cyclophosphamide, which we know works. So now we see that the new drug works as well as the old drug. So if you we established, as I said, a base camp, cyclophosphamide works. Now we find we have a second drug that works just as well as cyclophosphamide for a while, but it carry, can be carried on for years. So now we've gone further than we did before. We're not at the top yet, but we're getting there. And uh, that uh, thing that they do, that worked better as well. That showed benefit too. Good. Rodman skin score is better. <laughs> and that's just some thoughts about the study. Just says that it, it, it worked. Uh, and now we have a whole new world of having a choice. If the first one didn't, we have a second to use. If that one used, we can go back to the first. Or we might even use a combination. Or we might use one of these plus an antifibrotic. So go ahead. Uh, that's fine. Yep. Good. Um, yeah, that's fine. We're good. Keep going. Go on. Go on. Now, one, so now what are we looking at? We're looking at rituximab, which is a really powerful anti-inflammatory drug. So that might be able to do things that these drugs do, but do it even better and even safer, or different at least, so that if you don't do well with one of the first two, now you can have the third. And rituximab works in a different way to the first two, so it's achieving the same end in a different way. So that's why there's some excitement. Doing this thing with anti-inflammatory drugs that stop lymphocytes from working, that seems to be a good thing. And now we have different ways of affecting lymphocyte biology. Now they may be effective in this disease. So we have a whole new list of things to work our way through. That's what's exciting about this. Good. Great. That's fine. Except the bottom bit. OK? We're slow. This is ponderous. The SLS study, the first one, is about 10, 12 years ago. We heard about its design. We heard about its results about five or six years ago. And it's only in the last two or three years, really, that everybody's understanding how to implement it. Now SLS2 is out two years, and we're, we're now working with its results. And these other studies are all underway. So unfortunately, the studies do take a long time to be designed and finished, and then to be spread out in the world and understood. It's also very expensive work. And it also requires that you sacrifice a little something, which is that you participate in these trials and give over your care to a protocol instead of to your, clinical, your, your, your clinician for the period of the study. But without that contribution, we don't make the progress that's been so obvious in the last couple of years and has been so exciting now to change how we see this disease and our optimism about what we can do to help the next person. So I'll thank you for your participation and I'll welcome your questions. Thank you.